My name is Dennis Caro. I do the work of an evangelist here in Little Rock, Arkansas, and we're so thankful that we have this privilege to come to you and study God's Word with you, and we have uh, just had fantastic response to the program, and we're so thankful of that and for uh, those that tune in and, and study with me on this particular subject. Uh, it's just been unique that we can go to God's Word and you see the relevance of it throughout every aspect of life. You know, the last three years I've spent, uh, you know, assigning a theme to uh, basically the year of study. And we, we assigned our first year that I've started kind of putting it together that way about the journey. And the journey uh, can apply, I mean, to about anything we want because that is life, you know. And, and so it is when you look at God's Word, though, you, it's interesting to see how that so many lessons throughout the Bible are reflective of this journey that we're on because of the vision of the future. We're walking to a place that is our destiny, if you will, our eternal home. And not only that, but then we talked about compassion. As things happen to us, we can feel that we're carrying the weight of the world and we begin to question or are challenged about how we feel about that. And uh, compassion, passion has everything to do with our love and, and, and how that we are reflective of, of Christ and God's love in us. And then this year, we're looking at the idea of character. And we have examined last week and will this week again a little bridge in our previous studies to where we're going on the idea of leadership and, and talking about the one who leads. And uh, the appeal that I'm making in, in this series, in, this, in these couple of lessons, is to begin to see ourselves outside the framework of just... Uh, a result or a product of our environment. Because the reality is, is that if we are in Christ, then we are being delivered or transformed, not conformed to this world. So that entire concept would have within it that we are transformed according to the will of God and we are different. Now that makes a, a difficult dilemma for us because when we're different, oftentimes Oh, well, we're not accepted by the world. So if you are a leader and the one who leads, you know, you, you should not be upset because everyone doesn't accept you. Uh, in, in fact, all of those in history and in the business world oftentimes were either rejected or mocked at or spoken evil against uh, before they truly reflected that destiny that they were on as far as uh, building a business or of something of that nature. But we, as care individuals, who we are, not the reputation, but the, the identity of who we are is reflected in time as we endure and as we continue on our course. And the one thing that we can lose if we are not careful is enthusiasm. An enthusiasm for righteousness. And that's what we're going to look at today is this concept of enthusiasm and also from the perspective of righteousness and what does that entail? Well, it's obvious that that's that which is right, but it's not just, it seems to me, my perception or my emotional persuasion, but it's actually what God's Word says. The psalmist David said, My tongue shall speak thy word for all thy commandments are righteousness. Now we looked or began with Titus last week talking about how that the Apostle Paul couldn't rest until he found him and when he did he gave him this incredible task and the task was to go to the Isle of Crete to a hundred, place of a hundred cities to appoint elders in every church. So Titus's influence and role was incredible because he had to take a list, uh, I mean, geez, these principles, these precepts of God's Word, go in and find individuals who desired an office and then pull them into an instructional level to say that this is what God has demanded or commanded of those who would be overseers of a church. 
And we can take that and then apply it almost to every aspect of, of life in general. Because when we look at that, what, those kind of qualities, in fact, with the exception of, of as far as an eldership or o, uh, overseers, uh, they're incumbent on every Christian other than being the husband of one wife. That we should all adopt and adapt these qualities. Now, the interesting thing about these qualities of leadership is that they were to possess them when Titus got there. They were to possess them when Titus got there. That would mean that they were leaders without a title. They were reflective of those qualities. They possessed that character before they had the, the title. Sometimes we wait to be motivated to do what we should do until we have the position. Well, the truth is, in Christ, we're already in that place. We need to begin to be that person of influence. Now let's look, and I'm going to kind of regress a little bit in the study now from Titus chapter 2 and verse 1 because there when we see Titus going to the uh, uh, churches that he says this about that. He's already given the uh, assigning for uh, those that would be elders commanding them and pointing them blameless, husband of one wife, faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. See, they had to possess those qualities before Titus got there. It wasn't that he walked in and suddenly someone said, okay, and I'm going to get my life together and now I have it. It was a reflection of his life. And now when Titus came there, he said in regard to that, qualities for all churches and every one. You speak the things which are proper or become sound doctrine. That is, suited for. That fitting for sound doctrine. Now when we say doctrine, people many times recall and that's not something we think of very often. But whoever transgresses, Second John 9, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. So we want to make certain that whatever it is that we're doing in and with our lives, that we are abiding in sound doctrine. So with that in mind, we begin to look at, like I said, anyone can be reflective of a person of influence or leadership, if you will. Because older women, reverent in behavior. So somebody could look to their life and see their reverence. Not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands. What an incredible responsibility of leadership to instruct, to teach for older women to teach younger women. And you know, you'd think that, well, that's just a natural reflex. I mean, you gotta love your husband, but actually they were learning to love, which takes it to a different dimension for us. And this is how we begin to see our lives. It's not just based on how we emotionally think or feel. And likewise, young women love their husbands, love their children, discreet, chaste homemakers, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. And that's, that's becoming sound doctrine. That is a suitable for sound doctrine. But now I want to focus on this idea of leadership and consistent with, uh, well, our, our Wednesday night study at the Little Rock Church of Christ and, and, and consistent with anything else that might go on in your life is when it says about these young men and these qualities that we have enumerated here, that you be sober-minded. In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. See, a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that no one or one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say to you. Man, that's a, that's a tall, incredible order. So, number one, I think that we can see very clearly there would be opposition to an individual who is of integrity but the clarity of mind and the quality of character can't penetrate 
the end of who you are. Oh, no, there can be gossip. There can be slander. Sober-minded, a pattern of good works, doctrinal integrity, reverence, incorruptible, sound speech that an opponent cannot accuse, having nothing evil to say of you. What we see in this is steady in behavior, controlling youthful lusts, and constant in the exercise of self-control. Consistent in one's life. That is, to have a pattern of good works, that's really, that's a tall order. Because now we are reflecting not just what we're doing in a moment, but what we're doing in our lives. And that's really what we're talking about on this subject of character and where we are going, where we've been, where we're coming from, and what we should be, our true identity. Now, the unique thing about this is that, that, you know, poor leadership will reflect on the whole. And this is true in every organization, in every group of individuals that has leadership assigned. When it says having nothing evil to say of you, if, if that's not true, then what we have is if you have individuals within a congregation or individuals within an organization that are corrupted, then there is something evil to say and it reflects. And this is what the, is stated. No evil thing in our acts or our demeanor of you. So one of the oldest manuscripts other than the very old manuscripts read of us having nothing evil to say of us, which is, as the last statement says there, the whole body is reproached for the sake of one or more. And that's why when we talk about this and when we began in Romans the 12th chapter, that what we learned was that we are many members but one body. We don't all have the same function, but we all function together. And so it is that when you have a reproach brought upon the church, when you have things that are done that are contrary to God's will, when you have the effects of gossip or slander that are exercised within the role of uh, leadership, within those that are be people of influence, the older women, and the reflection of, of women, uh, younger women and uh, these younger men. And you see that this quality of character is powerfully impacted by the words that we speak. And as we had in a previous lesson about our character, is we can know our character by those things that we say. And it's very difficult for us to exercise this in a practical life application, isn't it? But there is such a thing as practical life of leadership, just as the, in the exact same way that there is this practical life of rendering obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So how do you establish a, a pattern of good works? Now think about this, because he's saying that you reflect or a pattern of good works in Titus chapter 2 for the young men. And you also have in, within that, uh, how does doctrinal integrity relate to leadership? Well, see, what applies or what you teach applies to you. One of the grave dangers is when we begin to preach or to teach or to reach out to others and we act as if, you know, we are separate and apart from the very things that we're saying. If it's truth, then it applies. It's a universal application. And then we think about our communication skills. And there's some things lacking today in, in our society as a whole because we've become lax in our willingness to communicate. In fact, one of the first things that is stated in regard to individuals who perceive that one is overtaken in a fault, go to him alone, Matthew the 18th chapter says, and restore your brother. But we have now this mindset, a lack of character and a lack of leadership in personal integrity to go to that individual and seek that restoration or that communication. 
in an effort to try to help them. Instead, we, we slander or, or try to destroy. But verse 14 of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, says that we're no longer children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. By the trickery of men and cunning craftiness and deceitfulness plotting. So what does happen is that our culture, our world, whether it be in business, whether it be in the church, whether it be in just our social life, so much of our lives are hidden within the cloak of gossip about other people. And, you know, it's amazing to me how that all of us, self-included, if we perceive someone is overtaken in a fault or struggling in a particular thing, we're real easy to talk to someone else about that. But I lived it, have seen it, and been guilty of it. Where we would talk to someone else, but never go to that individual. And that's a great tragedy, and that is definitely a, a flaw in the character, a crack in our character, and a failure to communicate as God would have us to communicate. Because in that circumstance, you've won your brother. Speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is head Christ. And this goes back to where we were in Romans 12. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by which every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. The true aspect, the, the critical element that's missing then is that of compassion or love. And it destroys. It breaks down the very walls of truth, integrity. Those communication skills and then uh, addressing opposition. You know, this is the thing, and, and I mentioned this last week, that we're, we're either victims or we're victorious. We're, we're victims or we're victors. And we've got to be one or the other. You can't be both. I mean, yes, we may be uh, affected by what someone else does, but we cannot be controlled by what someone else does. Our leader, our, we're following Jesus Christ. And when we do that, then we are not conformed to this world. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind, proving what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's in Romans 12, 1 and 2. When we read last week from those verses from 3 through about leadership, it was all about this idea of being transformed, having the renewing of our mind. That's why this lesson is so absolutely critical. And it, it should be of no surprise, all that live godly will suffer persecution. If indeed we are in that realm, then we're not going to be accepted by everyone and others will be critical of us. Look at what the religious elite of the day did to Jesus. And if we're following Christ, we at times could experience the same. And so it is that let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good to the use of necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by which you were sealed in the day of redemption. And then here is the, the, the cutting aspect of this entire discussion. And that is in verse 31. What do we do then to avoid becoming victims? Because we could be pushed into various corners of our life in this world because of that idea, that mindset. But he says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now, remember having nothing evil to say of you? Well, there were those speaking evil. They could make accusations, but they couldn't apply it because of the character that existed within that individual. And so it is that we are to maintain, to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. 
And then our objective in the study of character. Therefore, chapter 5 and verse 1 of Ephesians, therefore be imitators of God as dear children. Walk in love. So, it is a, a great challenge to us to consider this, but here's what we learn about this practical life of leadership, of, of following Christ, which puts us distinct from the world and separate from the world. It's a way of life, a pattern of good works. And we develop godly habits, biblical knowledge, that is the truth of God's will, the control of the tongue, to maintain humility while holding to the truth. And that can be a real challenge, but that is what we are called to do. And our lesson in leadership is right is right regardless of peer pressure or popularity. Integrity of the upright shall guide them. There is an aspect in which we do not compromise our principles of truth or God's divine will in our lives for popularity or peer pressure. And so much of us can fall under that idea. Integrity, character, keeping your word even when it seems insignificant. Keeping your word even when the only one who knows is you. Never allow your emotions to overrule divine truth. It's about faithfulness in the little things. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. What does he tell us? You know, Jesus, when he was washing the disciples' feet, when we talk about this, why did he do that at the end of his life? We had a lesson on it. Was Jesus leading or was Jesus following? Indeed, he was leading. Even as I have done to you, you must also do to one another. This is the key to being a servant, to being a leader, even if it's a leader without title. Speak evil of no one, peaceable, gentle, humble, showing humility to all men, and speaking the truth in love, standing for that which is right. Leadership, accepting personal responsibility, directed by God's grace. It's not about the club. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That is the essence of true leadership. That is what is true.